I'm here with Nick Mamatas. Nick is a very prolific writer of um, works including Move Underground, The Second Shooter. Um, he's the editor of many anthologies and works in translation. You may know All You Need Is Kill, which was later adapted into a Tom Cruise movie called Edge of Tomorrow, I think. Let's see. You always have stuff coming out. So, like, what have you been up to lately? Um, not too much. A couple stories. Much. I always feel like I'm very behind. Really? But I guess something I finished recently was a long essay on the history of weird fiction in the Bay Area. That'll be in Weird Fiction Review someday. Um, since I work with a lot of independent presses, I seem more prolific than I am. Mm. So I've got stories coming out next week that I wrote seven years ago. Well, that's, that's, I mean, I don't have anything coming out next week that I wrote seven years ago. So that's, that's more than I mean. Uh, let's see. Um, I guess we'll just jump right into it. Um, so you write, um, a lot of varied stuff, but one of the things you, you keep going back to is horror. Um, and I wonder, like, do you ever worry about anything you write being problematic ever? No. Uh, I, this might be a short interview. No, I don't. No. Um, but I guess I, the issue is this. What, what, you know, text can be problematic, but it is far more common these days for individuals to perceive problematic stuff as a hobby. That that is true, <laughs> and so it seems like a bigger issue than it is. And the trick to not being called problematic is to uh, write for an audience of adults who like to read books. Yeah. And if you write for an audience of adults who don't like to read books but who like to be on on the computer all the time, they will see things as problematic. Yeah. Or if you write for uh, younger people who are very used to, they were trained by schools to. to to see every text as a didactic text and, you know, haven't uh, brought in the horizons yet, they too will think that it, that's how you critique a text. You look at a text and you find if there's something sexist in it or racist in it or whatever, or you circle that and then you get your A. And, and that, that also happens uh, when you leave school and get on the internet. And that is your, that is your task. Was that, uh, I know you have an MFA. Was that like how you were taught to read when you were doing Oh, MFA? no. I should say one, I got my MFA after sort of publishing. My, my genius idea was, I'll get an MFA and teach. And on the first day of my little residency program, I picked up a book called Tales Out of School by Cass Fleischer, who is a, an avant-garde writer who is also writing this memoir. And it was her memoir of being essentially a working class person attending graduate school. And mm -hmm. I open up this book and, I, and it says, and nobody told me that if you want to teach college, you have to go to a good one for grad school. Because you, if you, you know, get a graduate degree at Yale, you get to teach one layer down. You get to teach at Berkeley. If you get a graduate degree at Berkeley, you get to teach one layer down. So, of course, I was in the lowest school. <laughs> so I was not qualified to teach anybody, except for that school itself and other very similar low residency MFA programs, some of which, you know, have good teachers and some of which have good students. And don't get me wrong, but as far as prestige goes, um, my MFA did not open any new doors. Even though I had, you know, five, six books. And a bunch of short stories and a lot of nonfiction and journalism, and I could do two things. It was it was useless for me to to uh, get my CV together and try to apply for MFA teaching jobs, as I found out on my first day as an MFA student from someone who had the same experience. <laughs> so, like, the but no, we weren't taught to read that way, <laughs> or taught to read. I, I tried when I was teaching there, try to teach people how to read, and it was always a challenge. So like, um, so I, I just sort of in the same vein of the, the previous question, do you ever add like trigger warnings to your stuff? No, uh, no, I can't say it. I don't, I don't find anything that would be all that triggering. I mean, if I have a book called the second shooter, for example, would it make a lot of sense to say there's going to, there's going to be shooting in this. But right. isn't is the title does that work? I think it's true. Yes, you know, and 
I've written about LGBT characters and things like that. And uh, I mean, the issue with triggering warnings is that it comes from a community. It comes from the community of fandom. Yeah. And it makes sense in that context when people are writing for one another. People will say, I'm writing this fan fiction for these five friends of mine who I know from some venue in some fandom. It works much less well when it becomes commercial, as we can see with movie ratings, how movies are cut or expanded to get certain ratings, or uh, how every record album for many years had the dirty version and the clean version. And this was just a way to sell to kids as well as to sell to adults. And why even things like Batman? You know, you, if you look at the Batman film, can, have, can Robert Pattinson, the Batman film, sell out of cereal? Can it sell little sandals with the Bat logo on it? Or kids can go, oh, yes, I love that four and a half hour long movie with all those serial murders and stuff. That I want to be that guy. Give me his serial. No, that's why they've got a cartoon version. So they can sell these things. So no. Um, although, of course, on some level, I depend on publishing to do it for me. You know, uh, I have a story coming out, or a story out now, in this book, Black is the Night. And it's uh, stories and tributes to Cornell Woolrich, who you don't, may not know the name, but you know Rear Window. So you know it's like a hard-boiled noir sort of thing. So if you are upset by things like violence and... Um, inequality expressed via character stock types like the femme fatale, etc. You already know this is not the book for you. Yeah. I presume. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> and of course, fan fiction doesn't come with that. Fan fiction doesn't come with covers and you don't walk to a section that says horror on top. And so your Harry Potter fanfic can be them in a coffee shop. It could be them in a weird sex dungeon. It could be the same story, <laughs> depending on the scene. So there, it makes a lot of sense, I think, on some level. But also, any, anything that a community d builds has two things, two reasons for it. One is for a purpose, and one is to sort who's in the community and who's not. Mm -hmm. That's why we see so much conflict over trigger warnings. That, re that makes sense. Yeah. Um, like, I don't know. It's, like, I've gone back and forth on them, but I've sort of started um, seeing them more the way you do. Because I, mm -hmm. I used to be more like, like, come on, it's like a kindness. What are we doing? Especially as like a person with PTSD. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's like, I, I want to read more stuff. Of course I have to. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, I used to uh, be worse. Um, I'm doing a lot better worse, now. Just but, just an idea, but there's, yeah. I'm, what? Not worse. You're not worse. Just had a different idea. I, I was not doing well. <laughs> oh, you mean with PTSD, TSD? Or, or do you mean with your thoughts about trigger warnings? Um, I, with my PTSD, I was not, I was not, oh, okay, sorry. I, I was thought you were talking about well. how your trigger warning idea used to be worse. Gotcha. Right. Yeah, no, but so, so I was definitely like hoping to read more stuff. So hoping that people would like tell me what was in the book yeah. so that I could just pick up the book and be like, oh, okay, I'm going to be fine with this. Yeah. But, um, I recently started reading like studies and stuff that, that mm -hmm. indicate that, um, there's a chance that they might not work. <laughs> Well, it's, it's folk psychology. It wasn't yeah. created by therapists or clinical psychologists. It was created by people trying to find a way around their problems. Yeah. Like, I, I so did there's no learn clue, it. But also, I will say, I read yeah. one of those studies, and I was not convinced by it because the study yeah. was, they went was to mechanical therapy. It typical people because you, can't, because you can't ethically, like, say, you know, bring a bunch of people who, who've been, like, stabbed and be like, okay, we're going to do a study where we're going to show you some stabbings. Here we go. Like, you can't yeah. do that. <laughs> and I read one study, and uh, the, the, the triggering material they used was from uh, Crime and Punishment. So it was 19th century Russian literature translated, probably the public domain translation from 100 years ago. This is and, of course, stuff. this is very lyrical and very dark, and it is dark stuff. It is. But it's not, the, it's not a kind of jump scare. For the most part, people who are, who are reading this for a mechanical Turk for 25 cents an hour are not, are not thinking, oh, my gosh, what's, not the axe, not the landlady. No, no. They're thinking, what the fuck is this? <laughs> it's true. I mean, I, like, I love Russian literature, but I can't imagine, like, the public domain translation. Exactly, getting, getting psyched up about it. So it was yeah. a weird choice. And, of course, nobody gets – so the only people who got triggered were people like, oh, there's an axe murder in this? I didn't even notice when I first read it. But if you're told, <laughs> watch out for the axe murder, you're going to be ready for it. 
So I don't know if that has any particular proof that it doesn't work or does work. But we are seeing it shift, right? We're seeing it shift from trigger warning to content warning. Right. It's not necessarily about some everybody having a really extreme psychological reaction, though that happens all the time. Or to content note, which is essentially used as marketing. Yes. And I've certainly had people tell me, well, I like these content notes. I don't get triggered. I'm not upset by it. But one, I, it's etiquette, so I want to see people do it. And I look around for, I like, I don't even know what half of these words mean. I like Dead Does Cinnamon Buns Coffee Shop AU. That's that's definitely one way it's used in fandom. Like speaking yeah. is like I was not to toot my own horn, but I I was not writing for like five of my friends. I got like thirty thousand people to read my shit, mm -hmm. and yeah. people looked for whatever sh weird shit they wanted. And it was what it it was what what weird shit were you producing for these thirty thousand people? Uh, mostly just porn, just regular porn. <laughs> which is which is all fan about whom? Is, honestly <laughs> Regard, about whom i'm not going to say oh, okay. <laughs> i'm not going to get... uh, yes what? was it emily blunt and tom cruise it was not emily blunt and Trump, tom uh, cruise it was but forget not it. Yes. forget it yeah. not your fandom that's right <laughs> let's see so like I don't know. There, there. I recently saw, and you know, you can find weirdos on the internet anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But like somebody that everybody hates right now um, did a story where, with Lady and the Tiger. They they re rewrote Lady and the Tiger, where mm -hmm. they got rid of all the ambiguity, which they didn't like. Right. Um, and they trigger warnings. Um, Gladi gladi gladiator coliseums uh-huh yeah <laughs> and it was um like i i don't know maybe it was unfair to single that person out because you can find weirdos anywhere but um mm -hmm. it turns out that person was part of like a community that was extremely influential in in sort of mainstreaming trigger warnings and it definitely mm -hmm. I, I think it recontextualizes a little bit for me that that maybe this convention is not necessarily coming from like the best place, the most reasonable place, but I don't know if that should matter. Um, well, it's that community thing again. Yeah. You know, it's it about driving people out of communities, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Some people don't belong in communities, so it's good to get them out. But uh, when it's a sorting mechanism, it's going to try to sort. And it makes sense in a community, but it doesn't make sense necessarily in a broader world. Like the idea of a safe space. Safe spaces are good. Safe spaces are important. If you're on a college campus, you need a safe space. But the entire college campus can't be a safe space. And the entire internet can't be a safe space, but you can have safe spaces on it. You can run your own blog your way or your own uh, instance of Mastodon your way. But then when you step outside and think and you, and you get upset, how come you're not doing it the way I already, do, I already do it? It's not going to work very well. An acquaintance of mine recently became uh, – not to talk about Twitter all the time, and we should actually avoid trying to talk about Twitter all the time because it uh, it warps our perceptions of what's actually going on in the world. This conversation is entirely incomprehensible to 7.8 of the 8 billion people on Earth. Even if they all spoke English, they'd be like, what the hell? Why are you even bothering? But so this guy had uh, expressed some skepticism about a trigger warning, and some of the comments under him where the people were responding to him, I'm like, this man has no empathy. And we know nothing about him. I know very little about him. I, I know he's Canadian and uh, he likes Kung Fu and he uh, fancies himself a communist. He's got a kid. And that's all I know about him. So he could be very empathetic. He could be helping refugees. He could be giving all his time and money to charities and helping people out. He could be, you know, weeping at films. But he doesn't like trigger warnings or doesn't like this kind of trigger warning that he was talking about. So he has no empathy. Of course. This is a way of excluding people from the commonwealth of humanity. Right. And that's what anything is for. And that's the case with anything. Like, you know, when you don't say thank you when you get a Christmas present, you are you're, you suck. You don't give Christmas presents, you suck. You do give Christmas presents, you suck. So that's all these things are empowered that, in that way to be community sorters. Communities are, are machines designed to throw people out of communities. Right. Yeah. So don't worry about it.
It seems bigger than it is because you spend all your time on Twitter or Tumblr or whatnot. It seems like a, a current thing. And it's fun to talk about and it can be amusing. But outside of small niche publishers, it's not. And, and some marketing people who use the content note um, in a positive way, by which I mean, it's like, do you like lesbian fishermen? You do. And do you like uh, enemies to lovers? You do. And do you like melted ice cream? You do. Well, here's your book. <laughs> so they'll use that as a as a kind of promotional mechanism. But other than that, it's not really an issue. Nobody spends all that much time thinking about it. Because we have those things that take the place of a trigger warning. And sometimes it's not, you know, like what's this one about? Just look at it. Just who's this book for? What's gonna happen in this book? I don't I don't I mean, I I would assume it's sci-fi from, from yeah the exactly. Yeah. And is it about unhappy futures or pretty happy futures? I would say happy futures. Yeah, pretty happy futures, right? And it's about the future of energy. Today's change. It was a, from an Australian publisher, has uh, Greg Egan and uh, Paula Bacigalupi, Molly Tanger, a lot of people in here writing pretty compelling science fiction stories about the future of energy, like a post-petroleum world. Mm -hmm. And it has its discontent and it has its positives, but it's not a crap sack future of people uh, eating bugs and rolling over and dying. Right. And you can tell from just looking at it. Yeah. Like, we, yeah. we definitely, like, I've definitely, like, sought out, like, talking to, like, problematic stuff has sort of been the theme that I've sort of brought through these interviews. And I've kind of sought out horror writers for the most part mm -hmm. in part because that's who i talk to but also yeah. because like we already write stuff that it like i don't know it's just inherently triggering to somebody like we're talking about trauma a lot of the time yeah. like not that you know i think it's kind of a shitty trend to pretend like and here's and, and here's this movie that's a horror movie and guess what it's about trauma like it, we've, it's a little bit played out for me is just everything is trauma mm -hmm. But yeah. at least everything is supposed to be horrifying, right? right? And, you know, the covers tell you it's going to be horrifying. Everything about it says it's going to be horrifying. So um, I feel like the conversation is, is a little bit different because um, I don't necessarily think horror writers are, are less empathetic. I, I Weirdly, I find horror writers are, are extremely empathetic often. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes more empathetic than than genres that pride themselves on empathy. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we, the conversation's just so different because the assumption is it's it's that we're writing to adults um, mm -hmm. who are up for yeah. And horror is making a comeback. It so is. For many years, it was an advance, right? It was huge in the eighties, fell apart in the nineties. I entered it in the early 2000s, partially because it seemed empty. That, oh, I can be a good writer of horror, and uh, I won't necessarily need to compete with 250 other people who are already well-established with their long series and that kind of thing in, say, science fiction or, or crime. So it seemed fruitful. It also seemed aesthetically fruitful because people weren't doing all that much with it. A lot of people were rewriting their Stephen King novels they liked as a kid to a small audience of people who just can't get enough Stephen King. But Stephen King, of course, is very prolific. So you, who, who doesn't have enough of him? He provides you three novels a year after he retired. Right? He retired in 1999. He retired 23 years ago. And he still comes out with two novels a year and a short story collection every two years. Asshole. Good thing he, wasn't retired. Good thing he was hit by the van. Otherwise, it would be five novels a year, a year I guess. It's true. <laughs> yeah. And but now horror's making come back. Right? Tor has a horror, and th uh, a horror line. Other people are experimenting with horror. A lot of the darker young adult fiction is adultifying. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of romance that's sort of trending horror right now. There's, yeah. I would even say, like uh, Game of Thrones was heavily horror inflected. Oh, sure, of course. And George R. R. Martin was a horror writer in the '80s. He wrote a lot of horror short stories uh, and dark science fiction stories, so it, it seems very natural. But now that horror is making a comeback, there is, I think there is some kind of concern about, other than the 500 people who are hardcore 
and I'm, 500 is like a real number. Many publishers for many years made a lot of money selling 500 copies of books for 60 bucks a pop. Right? When you have a small demand, you raise the price to clear out the supply. But now it's back to the mainstream. So I think there is some kind of uh, concern about, do people understand this? I had an experience broadly similar to this. I was hired to write a work for hire book a few years ago. It was called Sabbath. Um, it is based very loosely on a comic book that uh, was independently published, but it's primarily based on four pages of text that was given to me by the publisher, which has a very different story than the comic book. And they said, make it as dark as possible. So I did. And I was, because I, I had read many stories when I was a kid from the same publisher that were really extreme, really gross. I certainly wouldn't want my kid reading them. I probably shouldn't have read them, honestly. Um, one example, there was a character in one book that I don't even just tell you the name of. It has sort of a bluebeard character. He's a vampire, and he's bluebeard, and he's also a pedophile. And so there's a scene with a bunch of uh, eunuchs that he's, you know, castrati, and he collects the, uh, he has the collection of the testicles in a little candy jar by his table. So that was the 80s. That was the kind of that splatterpunk 80s vibe. So Dark as Possible said, oh, you must want it at least as dark as that, right? <laughs> no, as it turned out, no. And they they uh, came back to me and said, you know, this is way too dark. We were thinking PG-13. Oh. <laughs> you can't have your hero kill people. What? And, and the, so, they have to, like, so they have to be these sort of de demonic figures that they kill instead. It looks like people. And actually, I will say the book was better for that for that commentary. More readable and uh, less extreme. But one issue was the book, the hero of the book, uh, who was a guy by the name of Hex and Sabbath, a pretty inexplicable name, is the world's greatest sinner, according to the priestess of the book. And so he's immune from the depredations and temptations of the seven deadly sins who have been personified on Earth. So he should be pretty bad, since he's the worst person ever. Worst person ever. But no, he's actually okay. He's actually, he's just, actually just kind of uh, rambunctious. He's like a Jack Black-esque figure. If anybody wants to make a movie, you know, Jack Black is available, I think. Uh, you can... <laughs> So we had just had different conceptions of what horror and darkness meant. You you have to if when you're talking to like a horror person, like you have to like yeah. like you know, if if I just talk to like a normal person on the street and I tell them like I, I like horror and, and they ask me what I read and I describe it to them, they think I'm a freak. And right. then if I tell talk to another person who likes horror, I'm like, ah, oh, mm -hmm. crossed was a little much for me, and they're like, Wimp. Like, yep. <laughs> And I didn't like Crossed either, honestly. I, I thought it was that was too much for me. I wasn't uh, a huge yeah, fan. It's, it yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot, and it felt unnecessary. <laughs> that is a comic book, so you can't avoid it. Like any text, you can kind of start skimming or skipping or just put it down. But if you open up something, it pops into your eyes, you know, immediately. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like it's just yeah. But but you know, I'll, I'll read. I'll tell people, yeah, I read Berserk, and then they'll open Berserk, and they're like, "What's wrong with you?" <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's just, yeah, but yeah, you you can't you can't tell a horror writer make it as dark as possible. Yes, because <laughs> any sentence is valuable, right? We have an infinite number of possible sentences in the English language, so it can get extremely dark. That's right. So, I want to go back to to a very timely debate that I'm sure we're all not tired of, and I'm um. I remember you and I slightly disagreed on like kidney person. <laughs> I think that's the, what I remember. Bad art friend. What? what? Yeah, bad you art friend. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, do, we, do we have a disagreement about that? I was in favor of the kidney lady. Yeah, we you we were, but I think uh, I think you were in favor of kidney lady, and I was in favor of the kidney lady. I think where we disagreed, mm -hmm. maybe very slightly, was yeah. I was very big on like. I think you were more okay with like, no, you, this, this sh canon should be a story. Like, that's fine. Um, I don't know. Whereas I was, um, I may be mistaking your position for Jeff Vandermeer's a little bit because he was very hard line. <laughs> you don't like he, he unfollowed me and subtweeted me as a fucking idiot, which is so Jeff Vandermeer knows who I am. And I yeah. think that reflects very badly on me, frankly. He's still, <laughs> he's still Jeff Vandermeer, and there's nothing I can do to take that away from him. And I guess that's fine. <laughs> but no, 
but ser- ser- seriously, mm-hmm. like it, I, I'm very gutted. So, so let's talk about some third person who may have had this opinion. Sure. That I probably didn't have. Why no. was he so awful? What was his awful? What was this person's awful opinion? Who might have been Jeff? No, I, I don't think something. it was awful. I just disagreed with him. It was just um, his thing is is you have the right to just you know you're a writer. You mm-hmm. take what's there. You make something out of it, and it's it's mm-hmm. not you know if it makes you an asshole, it makes you an asshole. Fine. Mm. That was sort of his his thing, where it's like it's not my job as a writer not to be an asshole. Well, I guess it was Joan Didion who said a writer's always selling somebody out. Yeah. And then, of course, she very famously took that back. And then she even more famously wrote a very exploitive memoir about her daughter. <laughs> then sold that her daughter. <laughs> so it's a weird impulse, uh, that's for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> and I guess maybe maybe we did have that disagreement then, because I, I uh, in the general sense, I do think people should be able to write about anything. Yeah. Including things their acquaintances go through. Um, having said that, what makes it worthwhile is whether it's good or not. And, um, and I should say, I, know, I was very vaguely acquainted with most of the people mentioned in the kidney friend, except for the kidney lady. Oh, wow. Okay. In that, back in 2006 and 2007, I worked for Grub Street teaching a, a genre fiction writing course. And I taught it three times there. And I taught a one day course for teens. Mm. And I didn't have much to do with them because I was a genre writer uh, teacher which was a new thing they were trying and they were confused by it and they didn't understand what I was doing or why people wanted to go there to my class. So I didn't have a, I wasn't chummy with them or going out for drinks. I went out to drinks maybe one time with a couple of them, but I knew them by going to the office and saying, Oh, hi, what's your name? And yeah, I'll find you on Facebook and see you your post once a year, that sort of thing. Yeah. So I'm acquainted with them and uh, I had generally, generally warm feelings as I do with pretty much any near stranger who knows my first name. So they seemed fine to me. I was very surprised at uh, the depth of animosity toward the kidney lady that was revealed in court documents and stuff, but was also revealed in court documents was the story itself. Yeah. Which wasn't great. Yeah. I, I, it was not that great a story. It was, it, there was more than one reason to make it not the uh, story that everybody in Boston had to read for a special literary promotion. There, there was definitely something... Like I, I, I wondered if it was my pl- like place to say I didn't think it was very good, but I definitely I I read it and I was like, I I feel like there was definitely you know a bunch of people and their friends sort of pushing it to be you know an, an American, I think it was an American short story, which is kind of a big journal, and it's like well, mm-hmm. this is just not that good. Yeah, the ending, uh, and anyone can look at this, uh, if you type in Kidney Lady Court Case, you'll see it if you want to. And the ending falls apart. It's a very much of a Raymond Carver-esque ending yeah. where someone has some emotional um, micro-event. Mm-hmm. And she's, you know, looking like this, but that doesn't tell us anything. We don't even know, That's not motivated by the character's actions, not motivated by the other person's actions. It... Uh, doesn't end. It neither leaves an emotional trace that we want to go back to, nor does it tie off a plot. So it just feels a bit underbaked. Yeah, I would, I would say that's fair. So, so in that case, no, no, you shouldn't have written about your friend, the kidney lady. You didn't do a good job. It's true. <laughs> yeah. A I good think- job would have had, um, would have been less, would have given everybody fair play, what they call in journalism fair play. In the old days of journalism, before every tweet became a press release, what you do is ask someone their thoughts and opinions, and then say, oh, thank you for saying that this guy's a jerk. Then you go to the jerk and say, hey, uh, this fellow here thinks you're a jerk. What are, what are your comments? And you give both of them a shot. Mm-hmm. In good faith, you give them a shot to get their best possible quote and present them both. And while fiction is not journalism, it can, you can stack the deck and do all sorts of things. Maybe you can't even help but stack the deck. Stories work best when someone, even if it's funny you're making fun of or dislike, has a little shred of dignity, a little shred of humanity. Yeah. If they're only a paper doll to be ma- mocked and you know made fun of, if you never give them even a, a second of, hey, wait a minute, why does this person think this crazy thing? Or why is this person doing this terrible thing? Yeah, it's like not even, interesting. Like even Flannery, Flannery O'Connor, who kind of writes cartoon characters. Yeah. Um. There's always something about this ridiculous piece of shit 
that's yeah. a little bit humanized often, mm-hmm, but not exactly. always. And and in the ones that 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 don't work for me, often it's because it's just a cartoon. Yeah, like you know, hot take. Flannery O'Connor didn't always read. <laughs> <laughs> the only girl boys read. It's yeah. Well, she's. I mean, she is great. Although she did write the same short story over and over again. I'm just reading Flannery O'Connor kind of filth here. I love her. It's it's a good story, but it's it's often the same story. That's everybody. That's what like a genius is, right? Yeah. What was James Joyce always write about? Ah, oh, Dublin again. <sighs> like man, we're just so we fucking tired. About about. Oh, a Jewish guy's neurotic in some place again. <sighs> Like check off There's something that niggles in someone's mind that then they're trying to <laughs> untangle it. And you can't untangle it because it's in your mind. It's, you know, almost uh, neurologically cemented there. And so people explore the same themes over and over again. Same with Stephen King. Ah, is a boomer upset about something? Ah, Stephen King it is. It may feel different because one might be in the past, one might be about nuclear power or cell phones or being a kid. But it's still, oh, what's on a boomer's mind today is his main theme. And that's why he's been so popular for 40 years, because boomers still buy a lot of books. When the boomers die off, I wonder if Stephen King will be read in the, in the latter half of the 21st century. But, I, mean, I don't century? know. Like, like, it's sort of a rite of passage for, for people about my age to have like, crept into a library and, and read a Stephen King novel too young. Yeah. <laughs> Like 10, 11. When I was working at the bookstore, that was a common issue. Was it? We didn't have a ton of Stephen King books, but we had we had a number of them. We would whatever where the new one was, and a couple of classics. You know, The Shining and whatever was recently reissued. We didn't have a huge list, but we had enough. And people would come in with their kids, and they'd say, "Oh, do you have any recommendations?" "Oh, sure, I got plenty of recommendations." And I'd just lead them over to the main either the science fiction section or the main fiction literature section. They're like, "Oh, what about the young adult books?" Like, "Oh, these are young adult books." You can also read them all the time. And they'd go, no, 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 we have to go to the YA section. I'd go to the YA section. I'd show them a book that I liked, like uh, Battle Royale. Like Kushu Takami, you know, and they'd be like, oh, is this violent? Like, yeah, it is. Well, why is this good for kids? Kids love it. Yeah. Kids love violence. Yeah. And like... it's better than things like uh, Lord of the Flies. Right. And Lord of the Flies, we see that uh, when authority is removed, people devolve into savagery, which doesn't seem to be the case in real life. And in a book like Battle Royale, when there's a tyranny, almost everyone is trying to escape or subvert or fight against that tyranny. Only the literal sociopaths are into the, are into the game of murder. So it has a very powerful so- pro-social message. And it's very exciting and has a lot of vocabulary words. And it's really long and thick. So kids should do that instead of reading a very short book. But yeah, people, and I'd say to the parents, well, what were you reading when you were 14? And they'd say, oh, I was reading Stephen King. And I said, are you okay? Did, did, did it work out for you? And you can't help it, but think, oh, but yeah, but my kid who's 14, he can't be reading this because now we have a YA section. That, that does worry me because it was, I mean, yeah. maybe I'm just like an old fart now. But it was it was really important to me as like I don't know like I mean I wasn't supervised <laughs> but mm-hmm. my parents you know had like you know the Warren Commission on on JFK's murder like on the bottom shelf where I could grab mm-hmm. it <laughs> so I did mm-hmm. and I I read that that I mean I did I probably didn't read the whole thing very closely because it had a lot of bo- big words and it was very dry but it had yeah. pictures. Right, I looked sure. at those pictures, which maybe I shouldn't have. Like, I, I had all kinds of stuff. They they were big um, sci-fi fans. They were big yeah. horror fans. And I just can't, I feel bad for kids who can't, you know, be 10 or 11 and, and read a book that they know they shouldn't. <laughs> like, and be able to go, oh, this is too much and close it and then go back to it. And it's just such a, it's just such a kid thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know, like, maybe kid things change over the years, but I, I, I genuinely think it's, it's maybe not good for them, but, you know, 
Uh, well, that, it seems like fan fiction takes the place of that because a lot of fan fiction is very explicit. Which is which is awful. Like I mean, which I, I think I, is what part of where the trigger warnings come from. People are worried that young people are reading this, and people who are young people are worried that they're reading this, and so it has so it takes the place of that kind of uh, illicit reading in this yeah. community format. Which unless which you I, have a lot of the warnings, a lot of the conflict comes out of that, and of course a lot of the uh, social beliefs comes out of that. Where yeah. now. Um, it was one of the famous celebrities, Ryan somebody, I forget which one, because there are a million of them. Just yesterday, I think, uh, was revealed of having a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or having a wife, and people were really upset. Like his fans, hundreds of his fans had written, gotten together and written a letter or promoted this letter saying, you know, oh, yeah, it's it not fair. The, it was one of the Chris's, and he has the 20, he's 41, and he has a 25 year old girlfriend, and they're just furious. Well, it was one of the Chris's. Yeah, the Chris's are, I mean, every, honestly, every Anglo person looks alike to me. Yeah. So, so I, good thing these people have in superhero films have their costumes on. So they, oh, that's Captain America. When they're all off, like, who the hell is, who are these people? I know Ruffalo, he's not Anglo. He must be the Hulk. Everyone else is the same person, as far as I could tell. But yeah, and it was basically, so he's in his 40s. The woman, whoever she is, is she a movie star as well? Is she's she like I don't a know, but very she's minor. 20s. Yeah. She's 25. And yeah. they're, and they're basically, both cute I mean, and they're both adults. Who cares? And everyone's, even if you believe what seems to be true and that your brain is not ready until you're 25, you're not really mature until you're 25, she is 25. Yes. So she's, her brain has plasticized. But of course, the hint is, when you're bad for, for not being single and thus available to us, although yeah, in your fantasy life, almost anyone's available to you, even people who are dead. You can have Napoleon in your mind, if you're sex fantasy, anybody you like. Imaginary people, dragons, whatever you want. But not only are you bad for not being single, you're suspicious. Suspicion of uh, pedophile adjacent activities. Which is insane. <laughs> yeah. Like that's that that offends me. Like honestly, yeah. like the sort of the sort of, you know, if you've got like any kind of power differential, it just whiffs of pedophilia. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. what are you talking about? What do you even care about anything at this point? Yeah. Or a height gap or or Looking young or, or this kind of stuff. It's just pretty, uh, pretty nice. But again, it's a very small number of people who, because social media is the, an ongoing press release system, they seem more important than they are. Yeah. So of the thousands and thousands of books sold, of the millions of copies of books sold, this group of people it seems very interesting to people who are online a lot, but in real life, they don't really have much impact. They don't have no impact because now some of them have grown up and started working in publishing. And that's part of why I think uh, some little bits of marketing have changed, some little bits of the kind of stories we're reading have changed, but that happens every 10 years anyway. Every 10 years, things move from a kind of a, a Mandarin lyricism to a straightforward plot-driven stuff, and it flips back and forth. Mm. So, you know, when I first started writing, there was a huge a uh, huge sort of uh, nucleic exchange between genre fiction and literary fiction. Where for the first time in a long time, people like Michael Chabon and uh, Jonathan Lethem were wearing their genre love on their sleeves. Even if they were not writing genre material, they were writing things that everyone could enjoy and people with genre writing protocols, reading protocols could understand and really like. And then that kind of moved away 10 years ago and now it's coming back with people like... Uh, Emily St. John Mandel, and uh, a lot of stuff these days that we're seeing combine literary and the thriller. Like where the crawdads sing is essentially, a, it's a straightforward thriller with, with literary elements. Often with a, with a focus on uh, women's interiority. So that happens anyway, but now I think we're seeing a little bit, especially in science fiction, fantasy, and horror, a little bit of things that obviously one fan fiction that was written as fan fiction and published as fan fiction is oh, now yeah. slightly changed or greatly changed. And uh, the concerns of fan fiction communities as far as the content are being explored and expressed. Yeah. But I that's guess. always been two things. Of, so that's always been of two natures, too. Right? We, have, we have these warnings and these conflicts and these fights, but also if you compare say, the sexual content of, of randomly chosen 10,000 pieces of fan fiction and 
ten thousand randomly short chosen published short stories. It's way more. Which one is grosser? <laughs> is it? Is it? Can you? That's going to be the fanfic is going to be much grosser. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. But yeah, it was definitely like rough. Like, um, there's the first novel I wrote, which you haven't read. You read the other one. Um, mm-hmm. When I was sort of detoxing from fan fiction, I was still like, well, I need a sex scene now. This is where the sex scene goes. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> this is just, you know, it's just sort of like how it's organized. You have to have one every, every, I would say, four chapters or so. Um, mm-hmm. Or else you're just you're just not moving the plot, <laughs> and it, it was. And that it comes was from. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if it comes from that, but it's certainly very similar to certain categories of romance fiction. Category of romance, where they'll even spell out, "We want this character to have two rivals uh, or two rivals for her affection." Yeah, oh, it's so you can very, have it's very both of them it. depending on how heat how hot the line is. Must end up with one of them. Others, you know, she can't be divorced. She can't go back and forth between them. That kind of business. And they always arrange these things pretty carefully. But within that, it's like a sonnet. Within that, you can do anything. Yes. And express all sorts of themes and express all sorts of crazy ideas. Or wonderful ideas. Yeah. I mean, I do sort of... The only thing I miss about fan fiction was I could bang it out really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as I was within the the, the structure... I could do yeah. that, but so that meant that I wrote the equivalent of four books a year. No, oh. and I jumped around from genre to genre. Like I wrote historical mm-hmm. fiction, I wrote sci-fi, I wrote horror, I wrote anything I wanted about the same characters, same stock characters. What do you mean you were from- same stock okay. characters? And I yeah. just went, what is what are the what is this dynamic when it's horror? What is this dynamic mm-hmm. when it's when it's dystopia? What is this dynamic? When it's a when it's you know medieval historical fiction, and you know I it, I did have people going, you need to write original fiction because <laughs> because mm-hmm. you're just not. It's like well, I've just written it all I want. It's Star Wars. I'm like you, I've written everything I have to say about Star Wars. I'm just going to do other genres, and they're like, this is great. It's wonderful. Mm-hmm. These are recognizably the characters, and you need to start writing original fiction because uh, but then once i started doing original fiction it was it was much harder to come up with ideas like mm-hmm. much much harder yeah anyway <laughs> um and that's guess, very common not not the not the hard part but certainly many people these days learn how to write first in fan fiction and then must unlearn it you have to yeah. because it's so um um like I was never, I was never somebody who. It's got a very particular lyrical style, which I never bought into. I was always very spare. Yeah. Um, but that particular lyrical style, I think, is is very purple, mm-hmm. and it it, um, I would say it's it's even kind of mushy, and mm-hmm. I think you have to to especially unlearn that because a lot of people like it, but it's um. It just doesn't move forward at all. Um, and it's got very little, it, it's got melodrama, but no real conflict. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd say. <laughs> so it reads a lot like stuff that wasn't published because that's, that's often how people write even before fan fiction, because that's what they learned in school. Cause that's a, that, that's a lot of 19th century literature, not the best of it, obviously. But if you read Edgar Allan Poe and Stephen Crane, and that's all you've ever read. And then you've watched television you say, I'm going to push these two things together. You're going to end up with purple pearls where not a lot happens, but also the things that do happen are really spectacular and weird and depend on you already knowing the characters. Yes. I I do miss some, like, I, I don't know. I, I really like, like, I really like kind of bad stuff. I like reading bad stuff for mm-hmm. some reason. Oh, I like luck because you have the internet. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Like I, I, I you know, I'll read, you know, visual visual novels, just the worst visual novels in the fucking world. Mm-hmm. I like kind of bad video games sometimes, and mm-hmm. I don't know. It's it's just um, I probably read more bad media, good media, and on purpose because I I really I enjoy that when something's really fucking up, it's often really weird. Mm-hmm. I don't know. 
It's true. That's what a lot of uh, early manga and anime translations were about. Like, oh, what a weird turn of phrase. What a weird, not quite English thing. And that, that's something interesting about that. I mean, I will say that I tend not to read bad things on purpose. And I put them down right away. I put a lot of things down right away. But that's what TV is for. Yeah. So I watch something like uh, nine to ten hours of professional wrestling a week. I was going to ask you. What... Yeah. <laughs> well, if it's if it's two guys in a camera on YouTube in front of ten people, I'm like, oh, wow, finally. Yeah, hit him with a soda machine in the back of the VFW. Go ahead. Get him. Get him. And you're just like a chicken. Excellent. Go, go. See that now I've I like I've noticed that like working class writers there's a guy there's a type of guy who writes <laughs> just incredibly prolifically and and watches so much professional <laughs> and I I've like I've wondered like what is what is that what is the 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 pro wrestling you know working mm-hmm. class writer pro wrestling enthusiast thing well, I think people of all classes like professional wrestling, though, of course, it does have uh, working class roots, partially because it came from carnivals and partially because the tickets are cheaper. Like if you go to see a WWE show at a big stadium, it can, it's, you know, say 70, 80 bucks. When I was young, it was 20 bucks. You go to see a basketball game, it's twice as much. Yeah. And it's on TV. It was on free TV a lot. It was on Saturday morning next to cartoons earlier than uh, sports shows. It's also easy to understand. You know, many uh, young boys learn about sports from their fathers, and that's how they learn math. Back in the old days, boys were better at math than girls. This is no longer the case. But one reason why this was believed to be true was because you sit down with your dad and go over the box scores of the baseball game or that kind of stuff. And, you know, coming from an immigrant background, my father had no idea how how baseball or basketball worked. He didn't know how Greek sports worked. He didn't didn't follow soccer or anything either, so it's not like that. But he was an unusual case. But certainly many immigrant people... Had no idea how American sports work or how to understand statistics or that kind of thing inside the sporting context. They could be scientists otherwise, but it doesn't make any sense for them. They have no background for it. But you put two guys in underwear in a ring, and one of them's going, and one of them's going, blah, 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 you know what's going on. Sorry. <laughs> so it's huge. And that's how wrestling worked for a long time. You know, when I was very young, um, the big heroes were ethnic strongmen. Bruno San Martino, he's the big Italian strongman. Pedro Morales, the big Puerto Rican guy who has the fiery temper. Ivan Putski, not too bright, but really strong. And, and even Hulk Hogan started off as like he was sort of an Irish-American strongman. They kind of played up his uh, Irish Catholic roots. And he, you know, have a big crucifix and do the sign of the cross and talk about Irish things. Even though he's actually uh, French-American, he's Franco-American, Terry Bollet. But he played not I, not deeply in Irish, but he didn't have a shillelagh and a cap. They've had those too, plenty of that. There was even a leprechaun for many years in wrestling. But he was running on the ethnic stereotype. Uh, the Crusher in Milwaukee would say, "I'm holding beer signs and I'm, my cardio's dancing the polka with the pretty girls in Milwaukee." Like that's that was the thing for many years. So it was really focused on ethnic communities and uh, immigrant communities, and that's where your working class comes from. That makes sense. And it's also won the circus. It's a soap opera. It's cheap. And anything could happen. That Unlike is. other sports where you kind of know someone's going to win, someone's going to lose. It's not, like a, it's not like a third baseball team's going to come onto the stage and, and beat up the second baseball team. <laughs> right? That'd be all over the news for weeks and weeks. <laughs> be the scandal of the year century. But in wrestling, every day someone's popping over the shelf, coming out in a mask, crawling out front of the ring, floating down, appearing in a dream. It's time travel. There's magic. Like the the first time I've I've, I've like I, I I I did have exes who watched wrestling, and it was I was happy for them. Let's say, and um, it. But the first time I've sort of got it was recently. Like this guy called Luigi Primo. And oh, yeah. mm-hmm. I've watched him and I just, I'm just overjoyed <laughs> watching this guy. And it's, it's the, I mean, I, there's probably some debate because obviously he's just not even bothering much with Kate. <laughs> right. Like he's not at all, but there's the, there's, I, I enjoy the camp of it. I enjoy, yeah. I enjoy that he's just very silly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, 
and and it's it's um I don't know. There's um recently Tom Scott, you know, he's this very uh he's this YouTuber who d- who does like he'll try anything. He get he makes a very fabulous living trying just anything that uh mm-hmm. that, that you could possibly want and he tried wrestling and he was talking about how you know, he got thrown around a bunch, got taught how to be thrown around safely, and he's like, I, I hurt more than I've ever hurt in my life. Oh, sure. It's like being a stuntman, except there's no, or very minimal, uh, safety procedures. And it's yeah. live. And they'll cut themselves. And, like, sure. <laughs> or depending on the other person to cut them, and uh, yeah. honestly, a lot of these guys are not not disciplined athletes. They're very good athletes, but they're not disciplined. A lot of them are people who watch out of the NFL, or who uh, were pretty good college wrestlers, or just kind of athletic guys who are bodybuilders or gymnasts. But to uh, for whatever set of reasons, couldn't really become the top, top, top in that field. Mm. But they. Uh, also have a better personality or are willing to dress up in a, like a crazy monster and have somebody else talk for them and then they can make their living. So you, with that, you end up with a lot of uh, people who are ready to accept pain. So in that way, it's like a, like a working class job too. Like, you know, when you're a longshoreman, like my father was, you know, why, what is he doing? He's selling his body. By yeah. Which he means. He wakes up at four in the morning, climbs a big ladder into uh, a gantry crane when it's 35 degrees outside and tries to fix it. And sometimes he comes home injured. Sometimes, uh, you know, he had one time uh, his coworker died on the job, run over by the crane. And you sell your body. And at the end of your career, you might be uh, hunched over or always squinting or have a hip pain or that kind of thing. And that's what you've done. You've traded your Flesh for some cash. Yeah. And wrestlers do that too in a way that other sports people don't do. If you are a boxer or an MMA fighter, you fight three or four times a year. If you are a wrestler, you pretend to fight. So on some one level it's easier, but you're doing it three times a week. So it yeah. becomes much, much harder. So like I think I asked you this um, when I mm-hmm. when I did an interview of you for my newsletter year years ago. But like, mm-hmm. how does like your working class background influence you as a writer? You know, either you know what you write and and like how you like conduct yourself as like a business person in in this industry. Mm-hmm. Huh. Well, I guess. I will say that, uh, so my background is Greek. My father was an immigrant. My mother is Greek American from the same island. And, uh, it is the case, especially among, uh, I'd say Greek American immigrants that education is highly prized, but a certain technical education is what's really highly prized. And so I was sat down as a kid with a, a T-square and a triangle and said, you're going to be a draftsman. And, of course, I, I learned how to do some drafting. And then the second I got good at it, computer-aided drafting came out. So all of my skills were useless. Uh. And uh, I wanted to get involved in film. And my asset was I knew a lot about electricity because I helped my father build a house. So I knew how, to, how not to die by tapping into a fuse box. I knew how to you know calculate amperage and make sure things wouldn't explode and I could handle wires. I knew how to how to wrap cables. I taught my son how to wrap cables the other day. I said, listen, if you ever need a job wrapping a cable, here's how you do it. Don't put it around your elbow. That puts a kink in it. Do it like this. And he was just bored out of his mind. He didn't care at all. I was going to say he, his mind was blown, but nope, that was the opposite. He did not care at all. But I knew certain things so I, I could get some work on film sets and uh, in video production too. And uh, what this also meant is as a kid, when you're a little smarty pants kid from a working class background, you're given science fiction. Yeah. Because there's science in it. It'll be good for you. You'll learn about being an engineer or being in spaceships or how math works and there's diagrams. This is this is like good stuff for you to read. Hmm. And I happen to be born around the time when Star Wars blew up, which is not really science fictional. But I was very into things like um, all the blueprints and diagrams of Star Trek spaceships. And I got a lot of that stuff. And my mother was a fan of Star Trek too and she also enjoyed 
science fiction and I'd watch shows like The Outer Limits and Twilight Zone, which were in syndication. And I was very interested in, in technical stuff. But also primarily interested in things like Spider-Man. He's like, oh, wow, he's a journalist. Maybe I'll be a journalist too, So because I really don't want to be a journalist. I want to be Spider-Man. And he was also poor. Like He was a poor hero. He wasn't Batman with a huge mansion. He wasn't Superman with a giant mansion made out of ice that came from his home planet. A lot of Spider-Man comic books when I was a kid was about, oh, First I was beaten up. Now I got to go home and eat saltines and peanut butter because I don't have any money. It's like, oh, yeah, this is what a superhero is all about. So I felt that kind of thing. And so you grow up reading genre fiction. And when it came time to decide I was going to be a writer instead because I wanted to work from home, I opened up the writer's market and saw that you can, you know, sell or play stories in literary journals for two, two copies. Or you can get three cents a word. From magazines that, oh, three cents a word, that sounds much better than two copies. I'm going to try that. <laughs> so that's really the, the, where it comes from. And, uh, you know, genre fiction is the fiction for working class people. That's why there's a distinction in, in the first place. What we call literary fiction, which we mean is psychological realism, was published in slick magazines. And genre fiction was published in pulp magazines, which are much less expensive. So who bought what? Working class people, that was their entertainment, was the pulp. And middle class people, and this is not to denigrate literary fiction or psychological realism at all. I love it. But it had a middle class subject and about middle class neuroses and middle class challenges. And so there's a certain level of provenance that you kind of need to have to be a literary fiction writer. You can market yourself as a working class writer in literary fiction. Like, oh, you know, I had, a, I had a tough life. I had a you know, drug addicts and that kind of thing. And I didn't have any of that stuff. I was, you know, my father was in a powerful union. So it wasn't that it wasn't, we weren't poor. Um, big ethnic families all over the place, mostly Italians, Greeks, Jewish people, Chinese people, um, you know, who had these far flung families and didn't have tons of money, but uh, things hadn't fallen apart. And Reagan hadn't destroyed everything yet. If I were born 10 years later, I might've been much worse off. That that is that is context I'm probably missing because I I hear somebody with your background I'm like ah he grew up it's just the worst no 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 it's no but yeah no it was, and I went to college yeah. um one train stop away from my folks I I stayed at home for college which is a very Greek thing to do and uh, at the time university was a thousand dollars because the because neoliberalism had destroyed the idea of funding colleges funding state universities yet yeah. yeah. And now it's, you know, uh, something like $12,000, but your wages haven't increased by that much as I haven't increased 12 times in 30 years. Oh, it's So it's, I was one yeah. of the last working, I was part of the last cohort of working class people who can go to college less, without tons of debt, without being shamed for going to college by saying, oh, you're just sponging off the state. How dare you? Don't you want to pay your own way? And I went to college on Long Island, which of course is, at the time was lousy with uh, arms contractors. Grunman was there, Fairchild was there. And all those kids from those middle-class, well-off engineers went to BU and went to uh, Dartmouth, went to Georgetown. And then the Cold War ended. And the Berlin Wall came down. And there wasn't much of a peace dividend, but there was enough of a peace dividend that a lot of their parents got laid off. And they all came back to uh, SUNY Stony Brook, where they founded the College of Republicans and tripled the membership in that organization and took over the newspaper, the campus newspapers, and said about complaining about tax and spend, tax and spend, all these liberals taxing and spending. And all these students from the inner cities coming out to Long Island doing things like complaining about Nelson Mandela being in prison. What's wrong with them? And that was me seeing a big uh, sea change in how college worked. And so you have people undermining their own education. Sitting there in a state university saying, state universities are terrible. <laughs> and they won. Yeah, they now did. state universities are terrible and they don't they don't aren't funded nearly as much as they were. And it's much harder for somebody from a working class background to approach any kind of middle class activity because unions are were utterly smashed. Most people in or the plurality of people in unions today are in public service unions. 
government employees, that kind of thing, not private unions. It's slowly making a comeback, but not nearly as uh, much as it needs to be. Manufacturing has been uh, decimated, and 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 uh, communities have been wiped out. So yeah, I lucked out because I'm 50. <laughs> Where I'm 40, I would not have lucked out. Yeah, yeah, it's been. I mean, you've been around for roughly the same world that I have been in, and it's been mm-hmm. it's been interesting. <laughs> Like I'm, I mean, I'm not fifty, so I, I guess I didn't grow up in like that. But I, I'm, I'm approaching forty. Yeah. And yeah. So on that cheerful note, do you have anything you want to plug before we go? Yeah, I published ten stories this year. Let's go through them. All right. Let's yeah, like, let's go <laughs> through all. This might look familiar. Here's a phase change. I, this is a future of energy. I published a story in here called The Flare. Check out this anthology. It's uh, very good. A lot of hard SF and social SF. What else do we have? Uh, Black is the Night. I wrote a story here. Um, what do I call this one? This is when you, this is what happens. <laughs> uh, the Man in the Sailor Suit, which uh, has some queer rep. Nice. Not positive. Don't get your hopes up. Good. <laughs> Fuck us, oh, honestly. I'm an Asimov science fiction this month. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. It's a story about Cyprus. So you, you got some kind of ethnic stuff there. Uh, I suppose you would call it cli fi, which is the most loathsome term possible for any kind of fiction. Sci fi <laughs> is number two, but cli fi is even worse than sci fi. <laughs> and that's called Drowned in the Sun, which, uh, if that sounds familiar, that was the AI generated title of the AI generated Nirvana song that came out a couple years ago. That's cool. So I'm reclaiming that AI art for humanity by uh, taking the title. Well, thank you. Speaking of seven years ago, the Lees of an Economicon is out now. Oh, hell this yeah. is a novel, supposedly, written by 12 authors. And every story ties to the next story, so they're like chapters of a book. And it's about the Economicon, the famous grimoire from H.P. Uh, Lovecraft being moved through history. So important things that happened, like the Civil War and revolutions and uh, major religions. And in my story, it's for the time my grandfather George met Frank Sinatra in Hoboken when he was a kid. So a very, very important, you know, vital historical moment there in my story, Liquor City, which is about Hoboken. I had a story in Forbidden Futures, which is a really fun print journal, all color, Based on, I'm going to murder this guy's name, which is unfortunate, um, The Art of Mike Dubich, who is the publisher of this. Oh, nice. And my story is called The Ultimate Modern Convenience. It is, this is the all-punk issue, speaking of uh, working-class stuff, punk and row wrestling and science fiction are the three big pillars there. So I did a retro-punk story called The Ultimate Modern Convenience. And there's, you know, David Gerald and Andre Norton and tons of wonderful art. Yeah, it looks beautiful. And, and black and white, yeah. Very pretty. So really nicely done stuff. If you enjoy comic books and uh, fantasy art and illustration, this is the book for you, the magazine for you. Had a crime story in Lawyers, Guns, and Money, another cheaper anthology. So some years ago, anthologies actually became very large, very very big. Yeah. When bookstores realized they could sell them like they were nonfiction. So John Joseph Adams kind of, I think, started this trend with a book called uh, the Living Dead, which is the size of a phone book back when there were phone books. And it had a lot of reprints from Stephen King and Clive Barker that he acquired inexpensively. And a couple and many stories from people who are not as famous. What would people walk into a store and say, you kind of think about zombies? They keep hearing about zombies on TV, zombies in the movie. They, they wouldn't give you a nonfiction book about zombies. They'd say, oh, here's this. You can read 45 different stories about zombies. And that taught Barnes & Noble and to lesser extent Porters and Amazon had a sell anthology. So anthology got huge for a while. People who I know, people who had stories in that book, they got $1,500 royalty checks. Oh, nice. For one forty-fifth of a book. So wow. that thing sold half a million copies and really sold a lot more anthologies. And that's dying now. But as you can see here, tribute anthologies are the next big thing. So tribute to Cornell Woolworths, tribute to Warren Zevon. And uh, my story is Detox Mansion, which is one of Warren Zevon's songs from Sentimental Hygiene. 
And I riffed on that. And there's a lot of great William Boyle speaking of working class writers. Um, uh, Matthew Quinn Martin is great. Hilary Davidson. Lots of great things here. And speaking of wrestling, oh my God. Oh my God. I just read Ter- The Territories, Volume 1. There's going to be more <laughs> of this. And the concept of the territories is before wrestling became monopolized or oligopolized, I should say, by one or two major players, depending on the time. It was a regional phenomenon, although it was also kind of a crime syndicate and a cartel. So there was the NWA, which controlled many different territories. They owned the world champion who would go from territory to territory, fighting the main guy at each stop on the way. So Florida had wrestling. Uh, Minnesota had its own wrestling. Texas had its own wrestling. And they all had their local heroes, primarily the sons of the people who owned the company, were the local heroes, and their champ would go around fighting them. So this is about that. That era of wrestling. So you go to the Florida wrestling, which is, you know, uh, a mix of Southern style and a lot of uh, Asian and Caribbean influences. You go to Texas, which is dominated by a single family known as the Von Erics. You go to Minnesota, which is uh, dominated by really authentic wrestlers who knew how to wrestle, who wrestled in the Olympics and had a very map based style. The ethnic strongmen of the Northeast that we were talking about before. So many different flavors of wrestling. And my story here is called Ibnis Come to Me, which is about the satanic panic um, and 80s wrestling in Florida. I also had two stories that were online, so I can't show them to you as covers. But one is a, a Lovecraftian story called When the Sun Hits. It was on Drabblecast. I don't know if we can put links at the bottom of YouTube. We can, I'll send yeah, you those I'll, links I'll, Yeah, give me the links. I'll, I'll put it at the bottom. Yeah. And that I write a lot of Lovecraftian pastiches uh, with different things. You mentioned Move Underground, which is Lovecraft meets Kerouac. This is Lovecraft meets Shoegaze, one of my favorite music genres, when the sun hits, as I'm sure everyone knows. So I won't embarrass anyone by telling oh. you where that is from uh, the album Souvlaki, you know. How, how dare you talk down to us? That's right. <laughs> yes. And I wrote a story for Amazon.com. The Evil Empire. What'd you write? The Evil Empire, which I normally would not do, but I needed a lot of money, and they had a lot of money for a very, very low uh, word count. And Writers got to take money college. where they get it. That's right. And it is called Secret Identities, and it is about uh, a Greek-American superhero in a world without superheroes. And apparently... Because I've never really been in the same room with an Alexa as far as I know. What, how this works is that if you go to an Alexa, if you go to a room with an Alexa in it, or you have an Alexa, you can say, Alexa, tell me a story, and it might tell you that one. Oh, cool. Out loud. That's, um, that's kind and of... If you, say, if you say, oh, tell me Secret of these by Nick Mamatas, it'll definitely tell you that story. But I have no idea. <laughs> that was my uh, 10 stories this year, and... Uh, I guess as a person interested in business, I'll tell you that I, I got as paid as low as $25 for one of these stories. I suppose it's $2,500 for one of these stories. You can probably guess the uh, expensive one was uh, from uh, Amazon. And that's what being a short story writer is about these days. In science fiction, fantasy, and horror, there's a, a decent market for short fiction and other genres, say crime fiction, it's not nearly as large. Yeah. For reasons dealing with fandom, as we are talking about this entire past hour. Yeah, I can't. I can't imagine fandom really latching onto crime stories for for whatever reason. Well, it's the I, I put it the uh, the opposite way. Really, we have so many stories inside science fiction because we have fans, and fans want to be part of community. And how do you get people to like you? What's one way to get people to like you, MK Anderson? Fandom. What would you say? Huh? Yeah, I can't. I could. I couldn't hear you either. So oh, okay, I was saying if you want to enter the community and get them to like you. What's one thing you can do? What? Give them money. Yes. <laughs> right? If you want the attention of famous writers or even people who are not so famous, but who might be on their way up, the thing to do if you are a fan of science fiction and involved in organized fandom of conventions and online discursive realms and that kind of thing is to start a magazine or to kickstart an anthology. And to be taken seriously, you must pay what they call the pro rate of around eight cents a word or more. Yeah. And that's great. But, of course, these things are really unprofessional in that the editor or publisher is not really being paid. It's either their hobby, which is fine. You know, it's, 
you're you're buying stories instead of Cuban cigars or buying stories instead of, you know, uh, renting a parachute to jump out of a plane. It's still your hobby and it's still a great thing to do. Or they're an entrepreneur trying to get a job in publishing or trying to get something started. And one way to do that is to sort of audition by creating your own thing. And because of organized fandom and groups like the Science Fiction Writers of America now called the Science Fiction Writers Association, who really hammered away for many decades, get paid, get paid, get paid, don't give it away. It is not really possible to get enter fandom wanting to publish without paying at least something. Yeah. And if you really want to be seriously, you must pay the pro rate. And that's why we have a dozen good magazines and a dozen good anthologies a year and another dozen good reprint anthologies a year inside that field. Mystery fiction does not have organized fandom. It's much larger. Many more mysteries and thrillers sell per year than science fiction novels. But it doesn't have organized fandom if there are mystery conventions that's mostly for professionals having panel discussions about writing and about uh, law enforcement techniques and getting things right in forensic labs and that kind of business. But not, but not people dressing up funny or flipping out all the time about crazy things like we were talking about in the only part of this hour. And so since there's no real market for short fiction, no one, no one with business sense says, I'm going to start a short fiction magazine. It's like buying Twitter. Makes no sense economically. <laughs> so nobody does it. So there are a handful, there are two big mystery magazines, maybe, maybe three big mystery magazines, and everything else is $25, $50 a, a story. Yeah. Yeah. But I like, I like short fiction, and as, uh, short crime fiction is a good challenge, and so I will, I will indulge occasionally and, and write some of that stuff, too. So that's what being a writer is like in 2022 coming on to 2023. Thank you so much for talking to me. My pleasure.